Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. This video is going to be the beginning of uh, a new series that I'm developing on uh, ethics and qualitative research. So the whole point of this series is to talk about ethical considerations with respect to various aspects of qualitative research. Um, I view the series in its development as um, a second installment, if you will, further information on my existing series on qualitative methods research. Specifically in this series, however, what I'm going to be doing is developing the concept of ethics and the application of ethical thought, ethical um, modes of reasoning to various aspects of qualitative research. Um, for those of you who are watching my videos for the first time, I'm just going to go through a quick, you know, two-second tidy of how to navigate my videos. Um, the video series that I do um, always come with uh, reference to a PDF, the notes. The PDF will be accessible by clicking the link in the description box. So click the link in the description box, it'll take you to the PDF. The PDF at this point in the lecture series is um, almost entirely complete. Uh, I will be updating the lecture series. I have to sort of vibe it to see how long I'll let it go. I'm imagining this series is going to be about 10 hours, 10 to 12 hours roughly. Um, so what you want to do is make sure that once you begin watching the series, just check every now and then to see if I've added um, added to the lecture notes themselves. Also, if you follow me on Facebook, I put updates on my Facebook page when the series notes have been completed and um, when the series notes have been updated in case you want to keep track of the notes itself. So click the link in the description box. It'll take you to the PDF. The PDF will serve as a guide for the lecture series. Print out the PDF, follow along uh, in the lecture notes. Okay, that's, that's basically that. Again, the, the book that I'll be using, I provided in the first video, uh, Ethics and Qualitative Research. I'll be using this and, and augmenting the book, the information within the book, with tons of references and links to um, secondary sources, to other journal articles, to other books, to .edu and .gov pages, and so on. So, again, the nature of the discussion is an analysis of ethics within qualitative methods research, and uh, let's begin our, our series. Okay, so this is Introduction to Ethics in Qualitative Research. Okay, and this is going to be uh, section one. Section 1.0. Okay, so let's look at this idea of ethics and qualitative research. Um, so this is going to be a very, very brief introductory history um, of ethics in what's known as human subjects research, right? So we're going to be talking about ethics and human subject research. The original timeline, I've, I've basically just selected a few points from the original timeline. Click the link um, labeled here. It'll take you to the full timeline. This is where I got part of this information, uh, just to give credit to the sources. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole timeline. It's just to get you an idea, give you a general idea of why it's important that the question of ethics and qualitative research is important. Usually, when people think about ethics in research, the first thing that comes to your mind are the atrocities that befell so many millions of people during um, World War I and II, primarily World War II, with respect to uh, especially the rise of the Nazi regime. However, it's, it's not exclusively to the, the sort of atrocities that the Nazi regime partook that developed into what is, contemporarily speaking, a very concentrated effort to regulate research, both in quantitative, qualitative, biological research, right? Research needs to be regulated. Um, in the series, I'll be talking about some of these atrocities, and it's not to say that Germans are bad or that Americans are bad or that whoever the external party was at the time was bad. I'm not here making assessments of their conduct. 
what I want you to recognize at this point in the lecture is the fact that these atrocities occurred and a recognition, retrospectively obviously, that these atrocities should not occur in future research. So that's the general idea to give you a sense of um, what's guiding um, my presentation at this moment. So I'm just going to read some of this. Uh, I don't need to, to, to do anything more than that at this point. So from 1932 to 1972, the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, um, a lot of people have heard of this, sponsored by the U.S. Department of Health, studied the effects of untreated syphilis in 400 um, African-American men. Researchers withheld treatment, and I'll get back to this point in a second, withheld treatment even when uh, uh, penicillin became widely available. Researchers did not tell the subjects that they were in an experiment, right? So the, the, the researchers didn't disclose to the fact, to the subjects, to the participants, that they were actually participating in a research experiment. Most subjects who attended the Tuskegee Clinic thought they were getting treated for bad blood. So, before I continue, what I want to identify, more than just the historical notes, as you guys know, I'm not a historian, I'm a philosopher by training, um, conflict resolutionist by, by profession, which is basically um, me implementing my philosophical training. The first thing that we want to recognize is, is the part that researchers withheld treatment, right? The idea that there was an ability to cure, or at least help or aid, those who came of their own volition, let's just say, um, with the idea that they would be treated for some element, right? So the idea of withholding treatment, right, is, is something that we want to return to, right? There is an ethical infraction insofar as we are withholding treatment, right? So I'm just going to write down some few things. Uh, the... The attempt to withhold right. yeah the attempt to withhold treatment when you have the ability to cure a patient in this regard um, and you don't use those abilities to cure the patient there's an ethical problem right we would say that you ought to help when you can generally speaking okay um, the next part that was interesting about this right is that the the, it's like the third line, the third sentence in there, researchers did not tell the subjects that they were in an experiment, right? So that the participants, which is specifically going to be incorporated in the discussion of qualitative ethics, right? Ethics and qualitative research, this is sort of just a historical account, is that participants weren't aware, right? Right? Participants were not aware of the experiment. They, they weren't aware of the experiment. They weren't aware of the fact that they were participating in an experiment. Right? This ought not to be the case. Right? So these are some of the, not just the historical facts that surround, and these are just a few, right? a very, very small uh, bit, but these are just a few of the historical facts. And from these facts, what we want to do is distill conceptually, at a very, very introductory level, um, the grievances, right? The grievances of why ought, it, why ought it be the case, right? Why should it be the case that participants are disclosed? I'm not going to answer that question. I'll leave that for you to contemplate on your own. But you get an idea, right? From the historical facts, facts what I want to do is distill some of the conceptual um, tensions, some of the conceptual, conceptual problems insofar as these infractions occurred. So additional comments from a different source. Again, from 1932 to 19... Um, 72, 400 black men with syphilis were purposely left untreated by the U.S. government to test the disease's long-term effects, including all the different um, sort of ailments that, that manifest as a consequence of this being, um, allowing the disease to manifest, right? So there is a sense in which, if you think about this, right, there is a sense in which the observational data I'm going to get a little bit deep, right, Just, but I'm going to go briefly, right? The observational data being sort of all of the ailments that manifest as a consequence of having some disease X, right? The observational data, that information, or specifically in terms of qualitative research, the interview and so on, the observational data, if that takes primacy over 